song about loving each other. Being God, loving each other, making music. They push back from the table to listen to his words, his secret plan before he had to go. It's not complicated, don't need To make it harder, build steeples out of stone, fill books with explanations of the way. But if we stop and listen, and break a little bread, Loving God, loving 
There we go. It's so good to be with you today. And uh, I guess I should introduce myself a little bit. Uh, we attend the Elkland Community Wesleyan Church. We live in Bad Axe. And um, we also pastored many years in the Wesleyan Church. I heard someone say uh, when they introduced themselves to me that they had attended the Pilgrim Holiness Church that used to be down the road here years ago. Well, that's our background as well. We were Pilgrim Holiness and then we came into the Wesleyan Church. Um, but I pastored in the East Michigan Wesleyan Church. You ever heard of East Michigan? Wesleyan Church, the district at that time. Uh, now we're a region, but at that time it was a district and we pastored in East Michigan District uh, for about 24 years. Different churches, different places, and got to meet a lot of lovely people. We have friends that uh, are friends, as I have shared with them many times before I'd leave the church, I'd say, you're friends for eternity, because one day we hope to see you in heaven, amen? And so you're our friends here, and you are going to be our friends up there, of course. Uh, my wife usually sings with me, but uh, she couldn't be with me today, so... Uh, I wish she could have been. She's the love of my life. And I'll share a little more about that later on in the sermon. I don't know how long your preacher, your pastor preaches, um, but I usually preach about two hours. Is that okay with you? Everybody raise your hand. No? Well, there's a lot of buzzing going on back there. I don't know. I, Maybe you've got some uh, roast on and, or a steak or something you're cooking. No, I don't preach that long, but uh, the pastor did share with me on the phone that I could preach 35 minutes if I want, 30 minutes. So he gave me some flexibility. I'll probably be done in 20 minutes, but we'll see how it goes. Two words I'd like to emphasize in our study today. You have your Bibles, I hope. And they are grace, grace and faith. And if you have a bulletin or something to write on, um, I'll give you some scripture. But first I'd like to start with the theme and the thesis of how to live the Christian life. Jesus made it simple for us to understand in Mark's gospel. Chapter 12, verses 30 and 31. But in verse 28... We find one of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating, and he heard Jesus giving good answers to all the questions that were brought up. And, uh, and so he asked him, he said, he asked him, he said, uh, of all the commandments, which is the greatest of all the commandments? And Jesus said this in 30 and 31, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Um, the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. I would say that after we're born again, if we are living 100% living up to those verses that I just gave you, that we are at our best for Jesus. And I hope that you are at your best for Jesus Christ. Amen, church? I'm going to keep asking you, amen, amen, amen. And so I'd like to hear you respond, if you would. Uh, when we learn to put God first and foremost in our lives, his blessings will come to us. There's joy unspeakable and full of glory when we, get, when we let go of those things in this life and truly dedicate ourselves and commit ourselves to God. I'd like you to allow me to share this poem with you. It speaks to letting go of things in life. 
As children bring their broken toys with tears for us to mend, I brought my broken dreams to God because he was my friend. But then instead of leaving him in peace to work alone, I hung around and tried to help with ways that were my own. At last I snatched them back and cried, God, how can you be so slow? My child, he said, what could I do? You never did let go. Something to think about, isn't it? We grapple with that, I think, on a daily basis. We hold on to things, and things get in the way of us truly serving the Lord every day of our lives and being faithful to his call. As the great commandment gives it, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Let me say that again. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're not part-time Christians, folks. We're not part-time Christians. We're full-time Christians living for God. And that's where the blessings come in because the more we serve the Lord in every situation of our lives and we're faithful, the more he's going to be faithful back to us and blessing our lives. Am I talking too loud? It sounds loud up here. Okay. Well, let me begin my sermon today with a question. How is your faith right now? If you measured it 1 to 10, 10 being the best, how is your faith right now? Is it the best? Is it an 8? I hope it's not down around 1 or 2. Maybe before the service comes to a close, it'll be higher than that. I hope so. We'll be speaking about two words in which we find scripture for today. And if you want to write one, this first word down, the first word is simple. It's faith. Faith. A simple word. Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 are the verses we're looking at. And we're going to be talking about faith for a little bit. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God... It is the gift of God. Let me say it one more time. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We begin this walk with the Lord by experiencing what is called saving faith. Simply having faith to believe that when we come before Christ in humility, asking forgiveness of our sins, he hears us and he responds in kind. God loves us, and he has a, a wonderful plan for our lives. But we get in the way of that plan sometimes. We interrupt it. And then we get back to God again, and we realize we've made a mistake, or not a mistake, but we've made a wrong choice. So often people talk about, well, my boy, he made a mistake, and he did this and that. No, he didn't make a mistake. He made a choice. It's either wrong or it's the right choice. Because a mistake often is unintentional, but a choice isn't. And so we have to think about that, Lord. Where am I in this? God loves us. Sometimes we may experience some bumps in the road in life. Any of you experience bumps in the road in life? I'll hold my hand up real high. Sometimes we may experience bumps on the road of life, that, and, but that's when it's the opportunity for our faith to grow if we just keep faithful and trust in the Lord. When Mary and I were married, now I'm going to tell a little bit about us. When Mary and I were married, September 12th, 1964, I never realized what 59 years of marriage would bring. It's been a fantastic continuing journey of love with five beautiful daughters and 16 grandchildren and seven great-grandchildren. Now, uh, five daughters, I never had a boy. So it got kind of lonely at times. I was always outnumbered. But uh, it was great. 
It was great serving the Lord all those years during that time. We had wonderful memories. We have wonderful memories. And God willing, we're going to have a lot more. I wouldn't mind living to be 100. How about you? I wouldn't mind. I don't want to outlive my children, though. There's so many people that do, and that's a difficult thing. Yes, we have bumps in the road of life, and they will happen, but our faith in God and love for each other will grow when being tested. Uh, Just one note of wisdom for married couples. The more you love God, the more you'll love each other. And I challenge you to that. The more you love God and are dedicated to God, the more you'll love each other. It just happens. That's God's plan for our lives. Uh, One of the bumps in marriage is trying to find out who's the boss of the house. Right? I'm still learning about that. Who's the boss in our house? And I'd like to share a story. Uh, It's entitled, Who's the Boss? A farmer's boy decided to get married. His father said to him, John, when you get married, your liberty is gone. Well, the boy said he did not believe it. The father said, I'll prove it to you. You go catch a dozen chickens, tie their legs together, and put them in a wagon. And then I want you to hitch up two horses to the wagon. And you drive into town. Stop at every house you come to, and wherever you find a man as boss, you give him a horse. Wherever you find a woman as boss, you give her a chicken. You'll give away all your chickens, and you'll come back with both horses, he said. Well, the boy accepted the proposition, and he he drove to town. And he had stopped at every house and had given away ten chickens when he came to a nice little beautiful little home and saw two old people, a man and a wife, standing out on the front lawn. And he called them, and he asked, Who's the boss here? The man said, I am. Turning to the woman, the boy said, Is he boss? The woman replied, yes, he's boss. Well, the boy asked them to come down to the street, and then he explained his reason for asking and told the man to pick out one of the horses. He said he would bring the horse back to him that afternoon. Well, the old man and the old lady looked over the horses carefully, and the husband said, I think the black horse is the better one. Of the two. And the wife then said, I think the bay horse is in every way the better horse, and I choose him. The old man took a careful look at the bay horse and he said, I guess I'll take the bay horse. The boy smiled and said, No, you'll take the chicken. We Christians are so blessed because we have earthly family and friends and we can enjoy, but we also have heaven as our eternal home. When this life is ended, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, we have something to look forward to, and that is heaven. The promise of heaven is so important. What a, there's a song that we sing sometimes, What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, what a day that will be. As a young boy, I recall how when we finished supper as a family and Mama was clearing the table, She would say, keep your forks, because the best is yet to come. I've suggested to my family that when God calls me home and I'm laying in the casket, I want to be holding a fork. 
And when people ask, what's he holding that for? Tell them, the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. God's word tells us he's repairing a place for us. Jesus said in John 14, 1 through 6, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Doubting Thomas comes along and said, Lord, we don't know the way, and how can we know the way? Jesus very simply said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Of course, we sing sometimes, goes like this, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. You know that chorus? Do anybody know that one? You ever heard it? Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other, for Jesus is the way. I'm going to sing it once, and then you can join with me, would you? Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there is no other. Jesus is the way. Sing it. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Sing it again. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. I was teaching an adult Bible class a few years ago and asked if anyone had a question they were seeking an answer for to life. A middle-aged man <coughs> said yes. And then he asked, how do humans find truth on earth? What is truth, is what he asked. What is truth? Well, Webster defines truth this way. Sincerity and honesty in character, action and speech, or just the basic truths of life. My answer was, we go to the unchangeable, final, absolute truth. And that's God's holy word. Amen, church? God's holy word. We are serving a never-changing God in an ever-changing world. Once again in Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The story is told of a non-believer who was lecturing a group on the folly of religious faith in general and Christian faith in particular, and at the close of the presentation, the speaker invited people to ask any questions they might have. In the audience was the town drunkard who had been converted to Christ. And in response to the invitation, the converted alcoholic came up front, took out an apple, and began to eat it without comment. Well, the non-believing speaker asked if he had a question for him. After downing the last bite of apple, the converted alcoholic turned to the infidel speaker and asked, was that apple sweet or sour? Angrily, the speaker replied, you're crazy. How can I know whether it's sweet or sour if I never tasted it? To this converted drunkard said, he said, and how can you know anything about Christ if you have not tried him? So true. We must try Christ. When we take that step of faith is when we know that his grace, what his grace is all about. Now just a few minutes of the word grace. That's our second word if you want to write that down. And there's an acrostic to that. Anybody know what the acrostic is for that? G-R-A-C-E. Put that on your papers, and I'll give you the acrostic. 
It is God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. Here Paul was talking about Jesus, talking to him. And three times Paul pleaded for the Lord to take away his thorn in the flesh. A physical problem that troubled him greatly. And in verse 9, catch what Jesus said to him. And he said to me, Paul said, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Now this is Paul speaking when he says, Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly when my weaknesses about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest upon me. And in verse 10, that is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Boy, what a play of words there. That doesn't sound real, does it? It sounds, someone that enjoys all these problems that he's mentioning, why would he do that? Because when he is weak, he realizes he is strong. He's talking about his spiritual life. All because of my grace is sufficient for you. Say that with me. My grace is sufficient for you. Will you say that? My grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. That's all we need. It's plenty. God gives us all that we need. It's sufficient for us. Don't search for anything else because that's all we need. Well, let's make it personal. His grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient for me. I want you to turn to the person next to you and just say that to them, would you? His grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient for me. His grace is sufficient for us. We just need faith to believe it and trust in it. Amen, church? When we experience that sufficient grace by faith, we will know that we are a child of God. We can know. My mother used to say, this is a no-so salvation. And it is. You can know that you're ready for heaven. It doesn't matter about all the circumstances of life that are taking place around us, all the troubles we might face, adversities in life. That gives us the opportunity to test our faith, doesn't it? And we can grow in that, as I mentioned earlier. But his grace is sufficient for me in every circumstance of life. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The grace of God gives us confidence in his forgiveness and helps us to know that we've been born again. In closing, here are some verses I want to give you of confidence if you'd like to write these down. 1 John 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. This is how we know that we know him. If we keep his commandments. It's conditional. If we keep his commandments. So if we're keeping his commandments, then we know that we are ready for heaven. 1 John 2, 5. Whoever gives, keeps his word, in him is the love of God perfected. 1 John 3, 24, he that keeps his commandments dwells in him, and he in him. And this is how we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given to us. 1 John 5, 2, by this we know that we are the children of God when we love God and when we keep his commandments. 1 John 5, 13, 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Now these verses give us the confidence and assurance and grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and they help us to grow our faith in Him. Above all else, our desire in this walk with the Lord is to please Him. Amen, church? Our desire, our utmost desire is to please God. And if you please God, you might displease others around you sometimes. That could happen. But remember, married couples, the more you please God, the more you're going to please your spouse. Amen? And you just might get a horse out of it. You just might get a horse out of that one. I go back to the verse we quoted earlier, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith. Both of those words are there. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. We can't save ourselves. I couldn't save me. I was lost and undone without God until he touched my heart as a 17-year-old boy. And I went to the altar in a Burt Road Pilgrim Holiness Church in Detroit. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Detroit or not. A lot of people move up here from Detroit. But that's the church we attended back in the 60s. And God touched my heart and went forward and knelt and accepted him as my Savior. Now, I was raised in a Christian home. Mom and Dad were both ministers. Dad was an evangelist. And then when Dad finished being an evangelist and started pastoring churches, then Mom became a minister, and she filled in for Dad when he was on the road doing evangelism sometimes. So I was raised in a Christian home, but still did not make that full commitment to Jesus Christ until I was 17 years of age. Oh, I, I accepted the Lord when I was five years old, what I knew about it, and then I got away from God between there and 17 and had to come back and accept him and commit my life to him. Anyone not commit your life to God? Well, this is a good time to do it if you want to. Let's just bow our heads for a moment. Lord Jesus, I just pray right now, if there's anyone here today that has not made that full commitment to Jesus Christ, has not accepted him as their personal Savior, does not have that desire to serve him with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lord God, I just pray that you'll somehow, your spirit will come and touch their heart as I'm praying and lift them up and help them to commit them, their heart to God, their life to God. They're all to God. And we're going to thank you for what you do. In Jesus' name I pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen. I'll close as I always have in my sermons. I say, I always say this, now go do the right thing. There you go. All right, come on up. Somebody else can take over, and whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. May the Lord bless.